Well, it's great to be with you guys tonight. Uh, we've got uh, we've got a lot to, to share. Uh, <laughs> let me let me just start by uh, sort of in, introducing ourselves. Uh, we've been married, uh, like Sam said, 52 years. We actually, uh, she became my girlfriend when she was 12 and I was 13. Uh, got married when, when she was 20 and I was 21. We were seniors in college. Uh, we've got four married children and uh, 10 grandchildren. And that makes uh, 20 of us all together and we love to get together. Uh, we've lived in five locations in three states, uh, serving church in, in various ways. Uh, many stages of marriage uh, represent uh, this group tonight. I, I, we've gotten a little information from Sam and Cynthia about who you are and, and so forth. Uh, uh, we're, we're sharing principles that we've learned uh, that have laid the foundation for every one of those stages. We, we've been there. And um, in, in case you're wondering where we're from, we're this, this, I tell people we're from South Jersey with this accent. Uh, most of them don't believe that, but we actually are from Tennessee. We've been here since 1996. And it's, it's been a joy to be here. Let me read uh, uh, from Psalms 127, <clears throat> verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. You know, we, we know how not to build a marriage. Uh, we learned that early. Uh, but we know this, that God knows how to build an awesome marriage. And he's done that for us. And we're excited about sharing that with you. Uh, Matthew 22, verse 37 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And uh, so, you know, the lesson that, that, that we learned in the beginning was we must surrender all. Uh, that Jesus is Lord of all of our lives and certainly including our marriage. You know, before we get into the principles we want to share tonight, we want to tell you a little bit about our early years. Uh, but one thing I want to say about, uh, we know that we have people in various stages of their marriage. And uh, these are principles, as Tommy said, that will apply throughout your marriage. But also we realize that some of you are participating tonight who uh, probably do not have a believing spouse. And we will be sharing uh, from our lives primarily as uh, serving the Lord together. But we, we also want you to understand that these principles are principles Is that work one for one. It, one? We actually, um, Tommy and I often, when we're uh, speaking with couples and sharing with couples, remind them that if just one of you applies God's plan, uh, then you're 50% there. Yeah. So, so we want to encourage you that everything that we say tonight is for all of us who are in married relationships. But as Tommy shared, um, I'm going to share for about a little bit about the first six years of our marriage because Tommy and I did not marry as uh, disciples and uh, we were not baptized into Christ until we'd been married six years and had three children, three of our four. Um, I know that some of you probably panicked when Tommy said that we became sweethearts at 12 and 13. Uh, that's true. Um, and yes, you have children that age. And when you look at them and you think that's not possible, uh, you never know what kind of plan God has. <laughs> I just wanted to go with the captain of the peewee football team. And that was him. <laughs> so that's where it all started for us. But we were sweethearts for eight years. And so you think that after dating eight years that we really would know each other. Wrong. We didn't know each other at all. And there were so many things when we entered our marriage that, uh, that we had lived very differently. Our expectations of one another as a husband and wife. And uh, um, you know, the first four years of our marriage, uh, we married, as Tommy said, when we were in college. Tommy was a, a college football jock and, and uh, 
I was taking 22, 23 hours a semester trying to catch up with him so that we could graduate somewhere around the same time. And uh, I will remind him that he's older than me. And so he was ahead of me in school. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, in, in those first four years, we were very worldly. Uh, we were worldly in, in the beginning in our campus life with college life and academics. Uh, we were worldly starting jobs and starting our family. Uh, we were party people. We could always make room for the party if it meant getting babysitters or whatever. And uh, so, you know, flirtations and um, sometimes drinking too much, the things that go with partying were our life. Uh, that was part of it. Um, we were not spiritual people. Occasionally we went to church. Tommy did more than I did, uh, but it was more when it was convenient to go or to save our conscience uh, with no commitment, no interest, no study in the Bible, um, really not um, being spiritual together or apart in any way. But at about four years of our marriage, the events in our life caused us to begin reading the Bible together. Uh, we didn't have someone to sit down and teach us, uh, but we began reading the New Testament, trying to read it for what it said and see what we could, could learn from it. Uh, and it began to change our lives. So over the next two years, uh, as I said, we had no one studying with us. Uh, God was very patient with us. And he used the word to show us that uh, we who thought we were Christians were lost and that we needed to be saved. And so after two years of reading and studying um, on October the 9th in 1975, we were baptized into Christ together on the same day. Um, we understood at that time that our commitment to Jesus meant that we were committed to one another for the rest of our lives. But you know, over those two years, we learned a lot about salvation and a lot about our walk with Jesus. Uh, but we really hadn't learned very much about marriage. So we still had uh, a long way to go. So we're going to share with you some principles that have, that have carried us uh, through the years. These are all things that have grown. Uh, we don't begin perfected. And we're still striving for maturity. You know, the, the first principle is uh, find your faith and feed it. In other words, uh, God really expects us to grow. And, and so the good part about that is the fact that wherever you are to, tonight, then you can start from there and start growing and, uh, and have a faith that, that God will bless it in a tremendous way. Uh, uh, faith, uh, uh, takes faith in God to have, have a marriage that pleases God. Uh, that's the only way that we know that couples would be, be successful in, in the marriage. You know, some people stay married for a long time, and uh, but they never have the, the, the great relationship that, that they could have if they had committed their lives to God. Uh, so let me read uh, Romans uh, 10 verse 17 it says faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ the word is essential to building faith so we've committed our, our lives to this and our marriage to this and we've done this daily for uh, over 45 years 46 years and that's what's uh, enabled us to change and to grow and to be what God wants us to be. Um, you know, the, the, the word is essential because that's what builds our faith. In Psalms 19, verse seven and eight, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Now the word uh, will revive your marriage. It'll absolutely change it. We must also feed on it and make it our standard. And uh, always be a learner about your marriage. 
And and Connie and I committed to that early, early on, once we became disciples. Uh, we went to the first seminar. Uh, I'm, I, I can't even remember exactly how we found out about it, uh, but uh, we went five times, five different times to the same uh, workshop. And it, every time it just increased our, our faith and it, and it increased our relationship with each other. And, and we just learned so much in those early days. Uh, and, and so just every opportunity we had, if somebody was having a seminar about marriage, we were on the road finding out where it was and, and, and attending. And uh, we just, we loved what it, what it said about uh, God's uh, love for us and, and having uh, de uh, to develop that, that relationship. It, it just, uh, it was very intriguing, but it was very wonderful to experience the growth that we were seeing in our lives. Uh, you know, the, the uh, so when we made Jesus the Lord of our life, then, then that's when we really could, could take advantage of all the opportunities that, to learn from other people, of books. We were always uh, buying books about our marriage. And, and uh, so it was just a great opportunity for us to grow. And, and we didn't have someone to initial, uh, initially get us involved in that. We just saw it and we liked it and we knew it was good for us. Mm -hmm. It was changing our lives. And uh, you know, as, as Tommy said, um, we went places to hear these things. Through the years, um, beginning from when we were baptized at 26 and 27, we've always been the oldest couple or very close to the oldest couple uh, in the church. And um, so, you know, we found ourselves, we would have to go and travel or read or search and, and uh, not to replace the word, but to enhance the word uh, is written in the Bible. And we would, um, it, we went from state to state. We called people on the phone. Uh, we, we learned to do whatever it takes because we saw after we went to that first uh, series five times, uh, we saw that our, our marriage could be very, very different from the one that we were living. Our life was full of reaching out to people and, and having people in our home. Uh, but we didn't know how to embrace having the one another relationship that God intended. And so some of these other sources helped um, to, to fill in the blanks for us on how the scriptures could work in our lives. But I want to share, you know, Tommy said this principle was find your faith and feed it. I want to share a little bit about my journey in finding my faith. You see, when, when Tommy came home and told me one day that um, I still can remember it, we were standing in the kitchen of this little house we rented and, and Tommy said, uh, I've made a decision that I want to live my life for God. And um, like I said, we were party people. And I looked at him and I didn't say it out loud, but I thought you are about to ruin our marriage. And then I thought, well, I'll ride it out with him till he gets over it. I'm still doing that <laughs> 40, 48 years later, because that was when we'd only been married four years. And, uh, but Tommy was always ahead of me. He was searching and seeking uh, much more than I was. And even as I began to, uh, to learn what we, love what we were learning from the Bible, uh, began to love some of the changes we were making in our marriage, I still uh, had a faith that was riding on his coattails, uh, a faith that, um, that was not truly mine. And uh, I was involved in things that made me happy and made me feel good. And, uh, and I loved the way it was changing some things in our relationship, but I wasn't where I needed to be in having my own relationship with God. So when we talk about finding your faith, you know, uh, each of us in our marriage had to find our faith. Uh, we couldn't do that together. Uh, we needed to, I couldn't ride on Tommy's coattails. And you know, I wanna share what made uh, a big difference in my life uh, when I learned it about our marriage. 
I want to share from the dreaded scripture. The one that you've heard every time you've looked at marriage. The one you were hoping we were going to talk about tonight, because probably some of you feel like you already tried that and it didn't work. <laughs> but I want to talk about Ephesians 5, verse 21 through 33. And I'm just going to read through it here. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so, so, so also should wives submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they'll feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and she must respect her husband. Well, you know, why is this passage read over and over to us? It's because it's true and it's God's design, but it's not the way I approached it. Um, I was learning so many things from the Bible and, and changing many things in my life. But when I would get to a passage like Ephesians 5 or, or Colossians 3 or 1 Peter 3, uh, I would read those passages and take that with the well but you don't know Tommy. <laughs> uh, I was so sure that in so many ways I knew more than, uh, knew better than he knew how to do so many things. And uh, I really thought that I was uh, learning to be a godly wife without this passage. And <laughs> that I was uh, uh, standing on my faith, growing in my faith, and um, but I couldn't, see this passage as anything I needed to surrender to. That all sort of came to a head one day when um, Connie, who is always pretty calm, uh, rarely ever displayed extreme anger, uh, threw something at her husband because she got so mad. And, uh, and I was a disciple of Jesus. Once I realized what I'd done, it was humiliating, uh, but I knew that there was something in my heart that was uh, gonna, needed to change. I talked to a couple of sisters and uh, they agreed that it needed to change. Which, <laughs> uh, but mostly I talked to God. Uh, it's one of the few times in my life that I found myself laying on the floor face down, begging God to change my heart and help me to be a different person, helping me to, to see why I couldn't do it. And the thought that finally came to my mind was kind of, you can't submit to Tommy and trust Tommy because you don't trust me. And was that really God's voice speaking to me? In my mind, it was, you know, and, and it, was, it was such a wake up call because I realized that, you know, that's really the problem. I don't trust God. I don't think his plan works. I don't see how it can work for us. I think we're different. You know, that we're the exception. I know better, not better than Tommy, but that I know better than God. And that was an extreme turning point for me. Um, you know, God's plan, as we talked, as Tommy read from Psalms 127, verse one, he said, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. You know, this passage was God's design, uh, but this God's design requires surrender. It requires surrender on both of our parts. Uh, you know, telling about realizing I didn't trust God and, and about my surrender, you know, I didn't trust God in, in many ways. It was the, uh, the peak, the the thing that it showed up probably in the most was my relationship with Tommy. And um, 
for me, nothing changed our marriage as much as my surrender to this passage. Um, have I ever had to repent again? Have I ever been disrespectful again? Yes. But I made a decision in that point in my life that has caused me to, to feel conviction when I know that I've stepped outside of, the, of God's design and to repent, to ask Tommy to forgive me. You know, this man is worthy of respect and I was failing to give it to him over and over. But also, I just didn't trust that, that God uh, had us, that he knew what he was doing. But I want to say this about this. Not only did it teach me to trust God in our marriage, learning to trust God in my relationship with Tommy enabled me to trust God in so many more areas of my life through the years. You know, I, I've learned through our marriage that God does have me. And has Tommy ever made any mistakes? Yes. And, you know, money was always one of our big issues. And not long after that day that I threw the checkbook and after the time I decided to repent, uh, a business decision came along that, that I didn't feel great about, but I gave him my opinion. And instead of uh, demanding my opinion, uh, I let him make the decision. And, and, you know, we got into that business together and we worked at it together. And, and that business didn't make it, but it was... I believe for me to see that how God had changed my heart because my natural reaction prior to that would have been, I told you so, you know, thinking that I knew. And, you know, that would have been so wrong. But by the time this uh, failure, which involved thousands of dollars, took place, um, you know, I didn't feel that way any longer. Uh, I didn't want to say that. I knew he'd given it his all. And he had believed with all his heart that it was going to be one of the best things for us. And, and I'd gotten in there and shared it with him instead. So, you know, we, we've got to find our own faith. We've also got to realize that, that we've got to trust God. These scriptures that we read about marriage, um, Tommy and I have, have heard them over and over and over again through the years. In, in, all the, in, in our own reading and all the times that we participate in marriage classes and marriage retreats, books that we've read. Uh, but they're true. Uh, God's plan works in our marriage, but we have to surrender. You know, the second principle that, that we want to discuss now is uh, to maintain hope for today and tomorrow, not for someday. And, you know, the biblical ho uh, hope is defined as the confident expectation of what God has promised. You know, that word means a, 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 a lot different than it, than spiritually it, it means from, from the scripture. Uh, we use that very flippantly uh, about hope I can do this or do that, but hope is, is a confident expectation of what God has promised that he'll do it. And uh, uh, people often, often tell us, uh, they hope to have a marriage like ours someday. Uh, you know, today is the time, not someday. And uh, this is uh, called a, a marriage workshop because marriage takes work. And, and so a good thing would be to start now if, uh, if, if you haven't already started to work on, on your marriage. Just start now. And uh, don't wait for someday because many have tried that and then someday never came. And so we're, we're here tonight to, to really encourage you. Uh, this, this is something that's been such a blessing to us. It's not something that, that we just felt like we had to do and we didn't enjoy it, but we did it anyway. It's brought joy and happiness and peace and, and a great marriage because we took God at his word and, and we, we really have tried to, to live it out. Okay. You know, one thing that, um, that we've learned is that marriage is never stagnant. Uh, some of you are newlyweds and that's exciting. And love the place that you are and make the most of it. Some of you are young parents and boy, have you been thrown for a loop. 
when you brought that baby home and so on, and how different your marriage was from that point on. Some of you have elementary age children and they, they're affecting your marriage relationship, new adjustments. Uh, some of you have teenage children and um, you don't know what's happened to you. It's like a storm has come through your household sometimes. Uh, some of us have adult children and we're learning another phase there. And some of us are empty nesters and we learn another phase there. You know, we never, marriage is always changing. It's so important to, to learn where we are today and to apply it today. Because if there's not a point that it's just gonna get easier because there's always a new dynamic. Um, but, but I just wanted to bring that up because many of you are in a different place. And uh, we've gone through all of those phases and every one of them has required effort on our part uh, to try to hold our marriage in the lane and keep it where it needed to be. You know. Matthew 22, 39, you know, the first and greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, guess who your closest neighbor is? <laughs> it's your spouse. <laughs> that's our closest neighbor. And uh, that's why God really wants us to, to love each other in the way that we, we love him. Uh, it just makes for a happy life. Uh, uh, let me see. What? Uh, <clears throat> One of those. Yeah. Oh. Uh, every one another or each other passage in the Bible uh, applies to our marriage. For example, in, in Ephesians uh, 4, verse 32, you know, these one another scriptures are something that, that many, many years ago we, we began to understand what that meant in our relationships with, with other disciples. But what it's really expressing as well, and maybe foremost, is their relationship and their marriages. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving uh, each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Colossians 3.9, do not lie to each other. Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another daily as long as it's called today. So we had to realize we were married to sinner, a sinner. All right, we had to come to grips with that. It, in Romans 3, 23, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And uh, we learned that when marriage is in turmoil, there's always sin in account. We have need, needed to repent all throughout our marriage. Uh, uh, Steve Kennard's translation, which defines repentance as a change of heart that leads to a change of life. And that's where it starts in our heart. It takes humility and surrender to, re to repent. And, and let me just give an example of my own life. <clears throat> when we moved out of Hartsville, <clears throat> we quit, quit our jobs. We were making really good money. Some people even thought we were rich, and probably in, there in Hartsville, uh, it appeared to be that. We, we had a lot. We had a brand new house, new cars. Uh, but when we left Hartsville, we, we quit our jobs, and we had to go looking for work. And I, I started working in the insurance business with Aflac, and uh, it became the most frustrating time of my life, just about, as far as employment and work was concerned. And uh, I began to hate what I was doing. And, and uh, I wasn't very good at it. And what I started doing is just lying to Connie about it, but not telling her the truth about how I really felt and, and the way that uh, I was neglecting my responsibility. And, uh, it was, it was a tough time for us. Probably one of the hardest times, if not the hardest, that we've ever faced. And just uh, being broke, not having any money, 
and uh, is very humbling. And uh, yet, uh, God got us through that. There's a lot of things that we've learned as we experience that that we've ne we never would have known otherwise. We know what it's like to to be broke and and to wonder where we how we're going to pay our bills and and having at that time they could call you all of these companies that you had credit with or had money barred or whatever uh, they could call you and they weren't polite they were cussing and bragging and and it, it was just humiliating and uh, but God used that to to help me to see. That in, in regardless of what we we're dealing with or going through, I must be honest with Connie. And that 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 brought that about. Okay. You know, when I think through the some of the sins that have haunted me through our marriage life and married life and the things that uh, you know, they're they're a part of my character. You know, there's many of those outer actions that we just we get rid of that they, they don't happen again. Um, you know, flirtations, the, the uh, drinking more than we needed, uh, more than we should, you know, many of the things that were in our life, we just stopped, that, you just stopped. But you know, it's a lot harder to stop pride and arrogance. Um, and as I think through our, our years in marriage, you know, those are two uh, parts of my sinful nature that have dogged me and that uh, it's been necessary so many times for me to be willing to say I'm sorry or I was wrong. Uh, and so hard sometimes for me to say those things. Uh, I say it a lot easier and more quickly now than I used to, uh, but it's still not an easy thing. And, uh, you know, just pride in so many things. Uh, even, you know, pride leads us to have a lot of concern about how we look, uh, how we look as a couple, you know, how we look as a family. Uh, it affected me a lot as our children were uh, becoming sinners when they went, made that transition from the little saints to the to the sinners. Uh, my pride was in the way a lot. So often I was more concerned about how I looked uh, than what was actually happening in their lives. That made me look. Uh, my arrogance, you know, as I've already shared a little bit about that, my, my thinking of myself more highly than I should. Uh, my thinking that I knew the best and better in almost everything. Uh, you know, I look at my life today and I think, what are some of the things that are more difficult for me now? Uh, currently, I'd have to say impatience. Uh, I don't know how often I have to ask Tommy to forgive me for uh, some time that I've uh, snapped at him or said something uh, sharp or, or disrespectful. Um, you know, I pray for God to help me in my life. You know, I have... Uh, I have pain every day of my life. I pray for God to help me manage that pain, but I also pray that I won't let it manage me because that's where I find my tongue or my disrespect or those sharp things uh, being said when I focus more on what's happening to me than I focus on what's happening to us. And um, so, so does repentance continue throughout your marriage? It certainly does. And as Tommy said, when you've got turmoil in your household, you've got sin in the camp, you know, and it's not just one person's sin. You know, that's one of the things we had to learn too. It's easy for us to focus on our partner's sin. Uh, but the truth is I need to focus on my own. It's the only one I can deal with and I need to repent. But there's good news about repentance. You know, um, in Acts 3 and verse 19, it says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. You know, it is so good to get the burden of sin out of your life and to get it out of your household. Then you can have fun. Tommy and I have an incredible good time together. Uh, we laugh, we laugh at the days to come. Uh, but when, but unload the sin in your, in your marriages. We've had to unload over and over and over again. But it always brings the best. It always brings those times of refreshing. Uh, and this is this is one another one of those principles that will be throughout your marriage. You know, when we leave the burden of sin, then we can laugh the days to come. And the the third principle and the last one we're going to talk about is keep falling in love again. 
over and over and over again. Uh, you know, we've had to learn biblical love in, in each stage of our marriage. And uh, so let's look at it. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, we're, we're all very familiar with this, but there's not a lot of people around us putting this into practice. I'm talking about the world that we live in. But God expects disciples to embrace this and let it be uh, the standard for our marriages. Uh, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. If you didn't take anything else out of this message tonight, if you just took this scripture and dwelt on it and read it and feed on it every day, let me tell you, your life would be much better. Your marriage would be much better. This is the standard that God is calling our marriages to be. And uh, this just answers so many questions. Uh, love never fails. Um, we learned that love is a decision and an action, not a feeling we wish we had. Let me read that again. <clears throat> love <clears throat> is a decision and action, not a feeling we wish we had. Only in Jesus can we love this way. No, it can be done any other way. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 13 summar summarizes our principles. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So where are we today, 52 years later? Uh, Tommy and I want to share a little bit about our life today. I tell you, we're, all, we're more in love with each other today than we've ever been. Uh, we love being together. And this pandemic has certainly sent us home <laughs> and given us plenty of opportunities to be together. And some people, I think, have struggled with that with having to be with your spouse so much, but we rejoice in it. We love it. We, we just can't get enough of each other. And, and God has is, is built this in us. It's not something that we're so special uh, that most people won't obtain this. This is for everyone. If God can do it for us, he can do it for everyone. And, uh, we, we just enjoy life. We, we, we love traveling together. And uh, we took a trip uh, with the, the Bean 20 uh, a little over a year ago. And, and we went to, we flew out to Houston. Uh, last summer. We flew out to Houston and, and we rented a car and we joined up with the Brett Bean family and the John Bean family, and then Bart and Heather uh, from uh, Florida came, and Jeff and Carrie and, and Jesse and Lena, the uh, Amendos uh, flew in or drove in, I guess. But anyway, we we just we we rented a ranch, and uh, it was a beautiful place in in Brenham, Texas. Uh, and, and we just had a blast for seven days. We, we rented this huge house that would held a lot more than 20 people, but we just had a blast. We loved doing it every, every two to three years. Uh, I, I, I don't know how many more we can afford to do, but we loved doing that. And then we just got in our car after everybody left and we just started driving. We drove to uh, uh, Louisiana and spent the night. We drove to uh, Florida 
and uh, where was it? Second night That's in cool. Pensacola, Florida. And then we then we went down to uh, to, to my sister's house in in uh, Tampa and spent uh, several days with her. We drove to uh, uh, Atlanta and met up with some people that were part of the national church that we were that we started many years ago and spent some great time with them, spent the night with them. The next day we we went to Tennessee, drove into Tennessee and uh, uh, stayed with Connie's uh, sister and brother-in-law. And, and my brother is also a disciple in Lebanon. He's part of the National Church. And we we spent time together. And, and then we drove and spent time with the, the brother that I got to study with that's up in the Knoxville Church many years ago. Uh, became a, a disciple and uh and then we and then we went to virginia beach and we we spent one night or two nights mm -hmm. one one night there and they were a month later we ended up back in new jersey we just had a great great time just being together mm -hmm. and so what god wants to do is offer this kind of life to everyone this is not just for us we're not special we're just in love with God and, and consequently we're in love with each other. Okay. You know, so, so where are we today? You know, I'll, I'll add some things to that. You know, um, Tommy is, is right. We delight in spending time together and the pandemic has been good for us. We've had fun. Uh, I want you to know that we have uh, watched enough TV that now we can crap that can solve any crime that's happening. We've become excellent detectives. Uh, we know when the when the uh, suspect is going to run. Uh, we watch so many shows, and uh, uh, but we we have enjoyed those things. We love sports. We've watched games together. These last two weekends, we've seen some wow. incredible games, and uh, and we cheer and and laugh and. Uh, get upset sometimes at, at what they can do. Oh, and, excuse me just a minute. I don't know of anyone that knows half as much about football and, and few men as Connie does. Well, I've been with him since I was 12. And he's been a football player most of that time. But, uh, but you know, we, we have a great time together. And the thing is, we do laugh at the days to come. I want, we want you to know that, you know, we talk about death openly and honestly. I'm 72 and Tommy's 74. You know, we might have many years left and we might not have tonight. And we talk about that. Um, but, we we pray about that. And we also pray that I'll be the first to go because she knows as well as I do, yeah. I, I won't be able to make it on my own. It, it's just, so anyway, we're hoping- We do that. pray about that. <laughs> but, um, but you know, it's it's that we can we can be open about anything. We don't have to hold back feelings. We don't uh, we don't have to hold back. You know what we think the future might hold for the other one. Um, you know, a question that usually comes to people's minds when when we talk about our life together is, uh, and they hate to ask it, but do you still have sex? And uh, our answer is yes. Um, it's not quite like you newlyweds in terms of frequency or in the times of half and 50 years. But you know, we have an intimacy that goes deep. And uh, we love each other. We love each other's touch. That's the last thing we do at night when we go to bed is we touch each other. We express our love to each other uh, because God has blessed us with so, so very much. You know, um, this is what we want to see in our children's lives. Uh, this is what we want to see in all of your lives. You know, we feel humbled and extremely blessed with what God has built in, built in our marriage relationship. And we're not afraid to share it and we're not afraid to call people to imitate it because we see how much joy it's brought us. And we want every couple in Christ to know the joy that we have in our marriage. It's been a pleasure to be here with yes. you guys. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, feel free to contact us if, uh, uh, if you'd like, but uh, it's been great to be with you tonight.